Who is Bill Gates? In 1980, some businessmen arrived at a small company named Microsoft. They had come to meet the president, a man named Bill Gates. Dressed in suits, white shirts, and ties, and carrying briefcases, the men looked important. And they were. They were executives from IBM, International Business Machines. At that time, IBM was the largest maker of computers in the world. When a young guy showed up, the man asked him the way to Bill Gates' office. The guy led them there. A moment later, he took his seat behind the desk. He was Bill Gates, the head of Microsoft. At that time, Bill Gates was just 24 years old. He looked even younger. His mop of hair, eyeglasses, freckles, and pullover sweater made him look like a teenager. But once Bill Gates started talking, the IBM men were impressed. They could see that Bill knew computers, inside and out. The computers that IBM made were huge. Some of them took up entire rooms. Big companies and government departments bought them. Very few people had personal computers. Small computers were just starting to be made. That's why IBM was visiting Microsoft. It was a young company that specialized in small computers. Before long, IBM made a deal with Bill Gates and Microsoft. He didn't know it then, but the deal with IBM would start a whole new era in the world of computers. It would also lead to Bill becoming the richest man on earth. Chapter 1 Young Thinker William Henry Gates III was born on October 28, 1955 in Seattle, Washington. Because he was the third Gates male to be named William Henry, the family nicknamed him Trey. Trey is a card player's term for three. Everyone else called him Bill. Bill was a very active child. He would rock for hours on his rocking horse, back and forth, back and forth. Years later in business meetings, Bill was known for rocking back and forth in his chair. He said it helped him think. Bill's parents were educated and well-to-do. William Gates Sr. was a successful lawyer. Mary Gates was a school teacher. After her children were born, she cared for her kids and did a lot of volunteer work. Smart and outgoing, Mary often took young Bill along with her on volunteer outings. The Gateses were a warm and close family. Bill's sister, Christy, was two years older and his sister, Libby, was nine years younger. On school nights, no TV was allowed. Instead, the Gates family talked, played games, and read books. Bill was a hungry reader. At age seven, he decided to read the entire encyclopedia. He read his way through all of World Book. Anyone could see that young Bill was very smart. For Bill, thinking was an activity like drawing or reading. Once, the whole family, except Bill, was in the car, ready to go on a short trip. Where's Bill? asked Christy. When his mother went back inside and found him, she said, Bill, what are you doing? Bill explained, I'm thinking, mother. Bill always looked for ways to challenge himself. He was left-handed. If he was bored in school, he took notes with his right hand. When he was 11, Bill entered a contest at his church. Any kid who could memorize the Sermon on the Mount got to have dinner at a restaurant at the top of the famous Space Needle in Seattle. The Sermon on the Mount is a long Bible passage. It would fill 17 full pages in this book. Bill learned it all by heart and amazed the minister. Bill was the only one who didn't make a mistake. I couldn't believe that an 11-year-old boy had that kind of mind, the minister said. Bill told the minister matter-of-factly, I can do anything I set my mind to. 
Winning mattered a lot to Bill. He hated losing at anything. Each summer, the Gates family stayed two weeks at a cabin on Hood Canal near Puget Sound. The place was called Cheerio. Lots of other young families went to Cheerio too. Weeks there were filled with fun, sports, and games. Every year, the kids held their own Olympics. All the kids wanted Bill on their team. Just because he was smart and used big words didn't mean he wasn't good at sports. Bill was small in size, but he made up for it in pure grit. No matter what he did, Bill gave his all. Bill's favorite sports were the ones in which you were always moving fast. Bill loved to water ski, ice skate, swim, and downhill ski. In sixth grade, Bill seemed to lose interest in school. Bill Sr. and Mary saw that their son needed a change. They decided to send him to a private school named Lakeside at the beginning of seventh grade. It turned out to be a great decision. The school pointed Bill's life in a new direction. Seattle and the Space Needle Seattle, in the state of Washington, is the largest city in the Pacific Northwest with a population of more than 600,000 people. It is a beautiful city, surrounded by mountains and water. It lies on Puget Sound, an arm of the Pacific Ocean. At the end of the 19th century, Seattle became a gateway north to Alaska after gold was found near the Klondike River. Thousands of people left, hoping to strike gold and get rich quick. Almost a century later, the city developed into a major technology center after the Microsoft Corporation moved there from Albuquerque, New Mexico in 1979. Bill Gates is Seattle's most famous native citizen. In 1962, Seattle hosted a World's Fair called Century 21. It gave visitors, including six-year-old Bill Gates, a glimpse into the wonders of the future. One of the fair's main attractions was the Space Needle, which still stands today as Seattle's most famous landmark. It was built to withstand winds as high as 200 miles an hour and earthquakes that reached 9.1 on the Richter scale. The Space Needle looks something like a flying saucer hovering more than 500 feet above the city. The elevator ride up to the observation deck takes less than a minute, but waiting in line for the elevator can take hours. From the observation deck, or inside the Space Needle's revolving restaurant, viewers can take the city skyline as well as the Cascade Mountains to the east and the Olympic Mountains to the west. Chapter 2 Lakeside Whiz Kid Bill was the smallest boy in his 7th grade class at Lakeside School. Lakeside was then an all-boys school for grades 7 through 12. Teachers at Lakeside worked hard to help kids develop their interests. Bill excelled in math and science, but he hadn't found his special interest yet. One spring day in 1968, a teacher took Bill and some classmates to the new computer room. Actually, there was no computer in the computer room. At that time, personal computers didn't exist. There were only large mainframe computers that cost millions of dollars. Not even a private school like Lakeside could afford one. So Lakeside had bought the next best thing, a teletype machine. At first, it looked like a big electric typewriter. Beside it was a telephone that connected the machine to a mainframe computer in downtown Seattle. The teacher showed the boys how to type a command. Clackety-clack. 
the teletype started punching holes on a long spool of paper tape. It made a terrible racket. Soon, the teacher's message was speeding through telephone wires to the computer several miles away. In a little while, the machine typed back the answer it received from the computer. Bill was amazed at what a computer could do. He started to spend all his free time in the computer room. He read every computer manual he could find, and he learned computer languages such as BASIC. A computer language is a code used to talk to computers. Several other Lakeside boys became hooked on computers too. The boys learned from each other as they went along. Lakeside teachers had planned to learn about computers and then teach the kids. However, it worked the other way around. Bill and his pals became the experts, then they taught the teachers. At Lakeside, Bill had discovered his life's passion. Now his sharp mind had a focus. Computers, computers, computers. Early computers. Early computers were giant machines. The Univac, a computer from the 1950s when Bill Gates was young, was a monster weighing over 14 tons. It spread out over 350 square feet of floor space. Despite its enormous size, the Univac had about as much memory as a handheld calculator does today. Computers in the early 1960s were run by transistors. The units, connected by cables, were as big as refrigerators. They had to be kept in air-conditioned rooms on raised floors where trained operators oversaw them around the clock. These mainframes cost millions of dollars. Only universities, government agencies, and huge corporations could afford them. Other businesses and schools paid a fee to use mainframe computers on a time-sharing basis. Chapter 3. Learning a New Language The WizKids formed a computer club. They called themselves the Lakeside Programmers. Soon, many of the boys were writing their own programs. A program is a set of instructions for the computer. Bill was 13 when he wrote his first program. It was for playing tic-tac-toe. For a boy like Bill, who liked to test himself, the computer was the perfect challenge. Every single program was a test. Would it work? Only if Bill had written the code right, exactly right. If not, the computer would make mistakes. Wrong data in, wrong data out. Bill was two years younger than most of the other boys in the club. At one point, the members decided Bill was too young. They also thought he was hogging time at the teletype machine. So Bill got kicked out of the club. Not for long though. Bill knew things that nobody else had figured out yet. The other boys needed him so they asked Bill back. Computer time wasn't free. General Electric, the owner of the mainframe computer, charged Lakeside School $89 a month to rent the teletype. In addition, they charged students $8 an hour for computer time. This was expensive. At that time, you could buy 66 comic books for $8. At first, the Lakeside Mothers Club paid the computer fees. Soon though, the Mothers Club ran out of money. Now the students had to pay their own time using the computer. Bill's parents paid for his costly schooling, but they told him he had to pay for computer time himself. So what did Bill do? He found a job. Years later, Bill joked that his parents drove him into business. A new company had just opened in Seattle. Its name was Computer Center Corporation. It had a mainframe computer. 
The boys nicknamed the company C cubed for the three C's in its name. Few people understood computers then. So C cubed turned to the bright boys at Lakeside School and made a deal. The boys could use the company's mainframe computer for free if they searched out bugs or flaws in its programs. For Bill and his friends, this job was a paradise. Here was a huge computer worth millions of dollars. It was under their control. The boys had to work during off hours, at nights and on weekends, when the company staff didn't need the computer. So after school, 8th grader Bill often caught a bus and rode to C-Cubed. Many nights, he and his buddies stayed until midnight. If Bill missed the late bus, he had to walk three miles home. The following year, C-Cubed went out of business. But Bill's career was just beginning. At age 15, Bill went into business with one of the other Lakeside programmers. His name was Paul Allen. The boys wrote a computer program called Trafodata. It measured traffic flow in Seattle. Eventually, Trafodata earned the boys $20,000. Bill and Paul Allen were opposites. Paul was two years older, soft-spoken, and somewhat shy. Bill was outspoken and ready to argue to make a point. Oddly, the two boys became fast friends. They shared a love of computers. They also both respected each other's ideas and intelligence. Bill and Paul talked for hours and hours about the future of computers. The possibilities seemed endless. They believed computers had the power to change people's lives. During his junior year, Bill got another programming job from his own school. Lakeside had just merged with an all-girls school. The class schedules were too complicated to make by hand. Some teachers tried to write a computer program for schedules. But when they failed, they asked Bill and a classmate to help. In exchange, the boys would get about $5,000 worth of free computer time. Happy for a challenge, Bill wrote a program that ran Lakeside's schedule like clockwork. An extra perk came with the job. Bill found a way to put himself into classes with lots of girls. In 1973, Bill graduated from Lakeside School. By now, he was on the tall side. Everyone at Lakeside knew who he was. He got ready to start college at famous Harvard University. Lakeside School had been life-changing for Bill. There, he had discovered computers. He had started his first business and earned thousands of dollars. He had also met Paul Allen, a friend who became his future business partner. Before too long, the two Lakeside programmers would put their minds together and do something that had never been done before. Chapter 4 Opportunity Knocks During his first year at Harvard, Bill was busy with college classes. Then. In the middle of his sophomore year, Bill read a magazine article that changed his life. Paul Allen was working in Boston at the time. He saw the article first. These words blazed across the cover of Popular Electronics in January 1975. World's first mini computer kit. Right away, Paul rushed over to Harvard to show Bill the magazine. Bill understood why Paul was so excited. This was amazing news. People could now buy a kit to build a small computer. It could do many of the same things as a huge mainframe. Its name was the Altair 8800. In actuality, 
The Altair wasn't the world's first mini computer, but it cost less than $400. So it was the first one cheap enough for hobbyists, people who like to do things themselves. The Altair didn't look at all like computers do today. About the size of a microwave oven, it looked like a black box with switches and lights. There was no keyboard. There was no screen. Plus, you had to put the Altair together yourself. Even once the computer was assembled, buyers wouldn't have much. They would only have the hardware, the hard parts of the computer that you can touch. But there was no software to go with the Altair. Software is the language program that tells a computer what to do. Without software, a computer can't do a thing. A computer without software is like a car without gasoline. Bill and Paul were struck with a powerful idea. They would write software for this new machine. Both of them were excellent programmers. They had the energy. They had the skill. They knew they could do it. Bill called the company that made the computer. It was Micro Instrumentation and Telemetry Systems, MITS. The company was located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Bill told the head of MITS, Ed Roberts, that he and his partner were writing language software for the Altair. Bill asked if MITS was interested in seeing it. Sure, said Roberts. He agreed to meet with the boys in a month or so. Yikes! Bill had claimed that their program was nearly done. In reality, he and Paul hadn't even started. For about the next eight weeks, Bill and Paul worked like mad. The challenge was huge. They didn't even have an Altair to work on. Mitz was behind in filling its orders. But the boys did have the instructions for the Altair. They could use them to build a simulator, a program that could trick a big computer into acting like a small one. In that way, they could use a mainframe computer to test out their new code. Paul set to work building the simulator. Bill took charge of designing the software. He'd think hard before writing anything. Paul saw Bill pacing and rocking for long periods before jotting on a yellow legal pad. Bill had to juggle his college classes with this new project. Something had to give. For Bill, it was sleep. Often, he'd work late into the night. Paul later described Bill during that time. He'd be in the middle of a line of code when he'd gradually tilt forward until his nose touched the keyboard. After dozing an hour or two, he'd open his eyes, squint at the screen, blink twice, and resume precisely where he'd left off. As the deadline at midst drew near, Bill lined up another friend from Harvard to help out. Just in the nick of time, the program was ready. Paul was chosen to travel to Albuquerque and show the program to Ed Roberts. The boys had worked so hard. Now their dreams were on the line. When Paul got to Mitz, Ed Roberts brought him to a messy table. There sat the little Altair, quiet and lifeless. Paul got ready to do a test run of their program for Ed. He felt tense as he loaded it. Their software had never been tried on a real Altair before. Would it work? Was the code right? Paul held his breath and put through the first command. Print, two plus two. Instantly, the computer shot back the answer. Four, success. Minutes later, Ed Roberts decided to buy the program. Bill Gates and Paul Allen had created the very first programming language for a microcomputer. 
Bill was only 19 years old. Chapter 5 Microsoft is born. Now that they had a deal with Mints, Bill and Paul needed a name for their business. They decided to call it Microsoft because they were writing software for microcomputers. Micro means small. In less than a year, they dropped the hyphen. Bill was president and chairman of Microsoft, and Paul was vice president. At first, the company was no more than a name. Paul took a full-time job at MITS as head of their software development. He was living in Albuquerque. Bill stayed at Harvard. Yet, both boys dreamed of doing more with Microsoft. So, in 1975, Bill took a leave of absence, a timeout, to join Paul in Albuquerque. With Paul working part-time, the boys began new projects for Microsoft. Bill's parents did not want him to drop out of college. Reluctantly, Bill went back to Harvard, but his heart and mind just weren't in school. They were back in Albuquerque in the computer business that he and Paul had started. Bill sensed that the computer world was at a major turning point. New computer chips had become available that could store lots of information on tiny wafers. Bill thought microcomputers were going to become big, really big. Here was his chance to do something important, and the moment to act was now. So he left Harvard again. This time, he never went back. Bill returned to Albuquerque and threw himself into his business. Soon, Paul joined him full-time. He and Paul adopted a slogan for Microsoft. A computer on every desk and in every home. That was just a wild dream in the late 1970s. It seemed an impossible goal, but the partners set about making it happen. By now, the Altair was a success. Other companies were starting to make microcomputers too. Like MITS, they only made hardware. Only one company, Apple, made both the hardware and software for its microcomputer. Microsoft was ready to make software for all the other companies. Today, we take software companies for granted. But as Steve Jobs once said, Bill started a software company before anyone even knew what a software company was. In the early days of Microsoft, Bill and Paul both did a little bit of everything, but Bill's keen business sense made him Microsoft's leader. He went to the road to drum up new business. He helped manage the staff. In addition, he wrote the code for the new software. More programmers were hired as Microsoft grew, but Bill remained the chief one. For years, not a single line of code went out of Microsoft until Bill went over it. Often, Bill worked all day and most of the night. One morning, a newly hired secretary arrived at the office and found a man lying under an office desk. She wanted to call the police. Laughing, the other employees told her that it was just Bill, sleeping after an all-nighter. Bill expected people at Microsoft to work late nights and weekends like he did. Most of the employees didn't seem to mind. They were young, smart, and driven too, and they believed in microcomputers. For fun, Bill drove his fancy Porsche 911. Often, he'd take co-workers out in the middle of the night for fast rides on the desert roads outside town. In 1979, Bill and Paul decided to move their company. The desert city of Albuquerque was out of the way for clients. Plus, Bill and Paul wanted to be in green country again, close to family and friends. 
So Microsoft moved to Bellevue, Washington, near Seattle. Before leaving Albuquerque, the small Microsoft staff posed for a picture. 11 out of the 13 original employees were in the shot. There was hope and determination in their young faces. Maybe they were looking ahead to their own bright future. Bill had always had a nose for business. When he was 10, Bill couldn't afford to buy an expensive new baseball glove. So he paid his sister, Christy, $5 to use her baseball glove whenever he needed it. To seal the deal, Bill wrote a contract and made his sister sign it. In 1980, Bill got ready to sign a major contract with IBM. It would make Microsoft a much more powerful company. IBM was then the world's biggest maker of computers, huge mainframe computers. Now they wanted to get into the small computer business too. So they went to Microsoft. What an opportunity. Bill was 24 years old at that time, and 32 people were working at Microsoft. In contrast, giant IBM employed well over 300,000 people. At first glance, Bill looked too young to be taken seriously by the businessmen at IBM. However, they soon saw how much he knew about computers. IBM decided to hire Little Microsoft to develop the language and operating system for its new personal computers. An operating system is the most important software on a computer. It runs the keyboard, the monitor, and all the other software programs. A computer without an operating system is like a car, all gassed up and ready to go, but without a driver. For nearly a year, Microsoft worked to create the software for IBM. And in 1981, IBM was ready to roll out its first microcomputer. It was called a personal computer, PC for short. Each and every PC was run by MS-DOS. MS stood for Microsoft. D stood for disk and OS stood for operating system. Sales skyrocketed. Soon, other hardware companies were making clones of IBM's personal computer. A clone is a copy. That meant that Microsoft could sell versions of MS-DOS to all these companies too. Before long, MS-DOS became the standard operating system for computer users around the world. All these users could share files. There was now a global language, and it lived inside computers. As a result, growth at Microsoft was explosive. By the end of 1981, the company had 130 employees. By 1983, there were nearly 500. Bill no longer knew everyone by name. Still, he stayed right in the middle of the action. He was a very hands-on boss. At meetings with Bill, programmers had to be prepared. Bill's brain was something like a hard drive. It stored a huge amount of information about both computer programs and the business world. In addition, Bill could see the big picture. He caught on very quickly to other people's ideas. If there were holes in a plan, Bill saw those too. Sometimes he'd shout at a programmer, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. New workers were sometimes taken aback by Bill. Paul later wrote that Bill with his intellect and foot tapping and body rocking came on like a force of nature. Yet Paul saw that Bill respected programmers who stood up to him and defended their ideas. 
What mattered to Bill was finding the best answer to problems. If he challenged new ideas, it was to make sure all the details had been carefully thought out. If so, Bill would end the meeting, no matter how much he had shouted, by quietly saying, okay. Workers who stayed at Microsoft came to understand and appreciate the big boss. The company's success spoke for itself. Clearly, Bill knew what he was doing. Employees were glad to be at a cutting-edge company. And besides, Bill had a sense of humor and fun. He set up summer picnics where teams of Microsoft employees competed in contests and games. It was just like the cheery Olympics of Bill's youth. The company was losing a very important person, though. In 1982, Paul Allen found out that he had Hodgkin's disease. This is a kind of cancer that very often can be cured. Paul had been feeling a lot of pressure at work. Fighting over ideas was fun for Bill, but for Paul, fights were stressful. When he was healthy again in 1983, he decided to leave Microsoft. Bill wrote Paul a letter before he left. During the last 14 years, we have had numerous disagreements, he wrote. However, I doubt any two partners have ever agreed on as much. In 1984, Bill appeared on the cover of Time magazine for the first time. He was now the face of Microsoft. From then on, Whenever people thought of Microsoft, they would think of Bill Gates. Chapter 7 On the Fast Track If Bill liked to move fast, he was in the right industry. In the 1980s, the computer industry was changing at a dizzying pace. There were new companies, new ideas, and new products. Competition was fierce. In 1985, Microsoft came out with their newest software update, Windows. What made it so different was a little pointer called a mouse. The little device had actually been invented years before, but this was the first time that most computer owners had ever used one. The mouse drove a system that radically changed the old PC way of doing things. Before, PC users had to memorize commands and type them on a keyboard. But with Windows, users could just point to pictures, icons on the computer screen. Click the mouse and an entire program would open. Point and click on another icon and another program would open that ran at the same time. Having more than one screen open at a time was why the new software was called Windows. Xerox had been the first computer company to use a mouse, followed by Apple. After Microsoft came out with Windows, Apple sued the company for taking parts of their design. Microsoft won in court when they showed that their product was truly different from Apple's. Windows was user-friendly, a new term meaning it was easy to use. Computers were changing what many words meant. Programmers liked to take familiar words and apply them to computers. Words such as menu, tool, dock, paste, and of course, mouse got brand new meanings. Work at Microsoft was more intense than ever, and so was Bill. Success didn't make him relax. No matter how well his company did, Bill was always looking over his shoulder to see who was gaining on him. There was hardly time to think. So Bill started going on a retreat once a year just to reflect on fresh ideas and the future of computers. He called this timeout Think Week. It gave him time to read about new ideas in the field. Many of the ideas were turned in by his staff. 
Bill realized that his managers also needed breaks. So Bill made Think Week a yearly holiday for them too. In 1986, Bill took Microsoft public. Going public means that anybody, not just workers at a company, can buy shares of stock in that company. Shares, small pieces of a company, are sold on the stock market. Shares in Microsoft sold at lightning speed. Overnight, Bill and co-founder Paul Allen became millionaires. By 1987, the value of the stock had risen so high that Bill became a billionaire. He was just 31 years old, the youngest self-made billionaire up until then. A billion dollars is so much money that it's almost hard to fathom. In his book, How Much is a Million?, David M. Schwartz figured out that it would take over 95 years to count out loud to 1 billion. And that's without taking any breaks to eat or sleep. Put another way, if you made $1 billion in a year, you'd be earning about $19 million a week, $475,000 an hour, and $8,000 a second. Eight years after becoming a billionaire, Bill was listed as the richest man on earth. He kept this top spot for many years from 1995 to 2007 and again in 2009. Bill's fortune was well over $50 billion. How long would it take to count that? Go figure it out. Chapter 8. Family Life Usually rich and successful, Bill showed no desire to get married. His business remained his first love. Then at 32, Bill met an attractive, dark-haired manager at a Microsoft picnic. Her name was Melinda French. When he talked to her, Bill could tell that Melinda was smart, independent, and fun-loving. It didn't take long before the two were going out together. Melinda, nine years younger than Bill, had grown up in Dallas, Texas. She was the number one student in her high school class. At Duke University, she got degrees in both computer science and economics. Then she went on to get a graduate degree in business. Soon after that, Melinda was hired by Microsoft. Right from the start, others could see that Melinda was a good match for Bill. She shared his interests and understood his business. Whenever they were seen together, the couple seemed to be laughing and talking spiritedly. On New Year's Day, 1994, Bill and Melinda were married on the island of Lanai in Hawaii. The wedding was world news. However, Bill and Melinda had privacy by renting all the hotel rooms on the island and hiring all the helicopters. That way, photographers couldn't fly over the wedding and take pictures. Bill was 38. He had stayed single longer than most men. Now he found that married life with Melinda suited him to a T. His personal life began to take on new meaning. In 1995, the couple took off on a trip to explore the world, going everywhere from China to Africa. The next year, their first child was born. The Gateses named their daughter Jennifer Catherine. Three years later in 1999, they had a son, Rory John, and in 2002, their third child, Phoebe Adele, joined the family. Bill had started to build a new house even before getting engaged to Melinda. In 1997, the 55,000 square foot dream house was ready for the Gates' family to move in. 
The mansion was built at the top of a steep hill overlooking Lake Washington outside Seattle. To save trees from being cut down, the home was mostly made from salvaged or old lumber. To save energy and keep the house safe during earthquakes, it was built into the hillside. The style of the house is very modern. And, of course, the technology is state-of-the-art. Guests can wear a badge with a tiny microchip that contains information about their favorite things. The chip sends signals. When a guest enters a room, his favorite music plays. The lightning and room temperature automatically adjust to suit the person's tastes. Even his favorite art is displayed on the walls. The works of art appear on screens that are controlled electronically. The estate has everything one could wish for. There is a game room, a movie theater, and a gym. A 60-foot long indoor pool plays music underwater. It also has a glass wall that swimmers can dive beneath to get outside. There, they find a boathouse, a dock, and a guest house. Of all the beautiful rooms, Bill's favorite is the enormous library. A bookcase behind the secret wall in the library holds a treasure that's over 500 years old. It is a handwritten notebook by the genius Leonardo da Vinci. Bill paid over $30 million to buy it. Despite the mansion's grand scale, the main living quarters of the family are fairly modest, with seven bedrooms. Only their closest friends are invited to this part of the house. Even though their fame is worldwide, the Gateses guard their privacy. Bill and Melinda want their children to have normal, happy childhoods like they both had. Leonardo da Vinci from 1452 to 1519 Leonardo was one of the most amazing people who ever lived. He was a genius in more fields than any scientist of any age and was an astonishing painter and sculptor. That's how Bill described Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo lived 500 years ago in Italy. He is most renowned for his paintings with masterpieces such as the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. But he had a brilliant scientific mind too. Leonardo designed things that were hundreds of years before their time, such as a flying machine and a submarine. Leonardo filled notebooks with his brilliant ideas and drawings. 21 of them survive today. In 1994, Bill Gates bought one of Leonardo's scientific notebooks. Each year, he sends it on a world tour to different museums where others can enjoy the notebook. Chapter 9 Facing Challenges a new kind of surfing became popular in the 1990s. Instead of surfing ocean waves, people began surfing the internet. The internet is a world wide web of linked computers. By surfing the internet, going from site to site, users can learn about almost anything without leaving their chairs. In its early days, Bill did not realize the importance of the internet. The internet frontier attracted lots of other business people, though. New internet companies sprang up almost overnight. One company was Netscape, which made a popular browser. A browser connects computer users to the internet and the sites they want to visit. Suddenly, Bill realized his mistake. He was jolted into action. He wrote a long memo to his employees. The subject line was the internet tidal wave. In the memo, Bill declared that the internet was the most important single development since the PC. He told everyone at Microsoft 
to make the internet a top priority. In 1995, Bill launched Microsoft's first internet browser. It was called Internet Explorer. By that time, Netscape had already cornered more than 90% of browser sales. Microsoft had a lot of catching up to do. Bill charged ahead by bundling Microsoft's browser with its operating system. Anyone who bought Windows got Internet Explorer for free. Because of this, Internet Explorer zoomed ahead and overtook Netscape. This time, however, Bill's bold actions got him into legal trouble. In 1998, the U.S. Department of Justice took Microsoft to court. Why? It's not illegal, after all, to have a very popular product that everyone wants to buy. But it is against U.S. law to prevent competition from another company making a similar product. According to the government, that's what Microsoft was doing. At that time, about 80% of PCs ran Microsoft's operating system. Now they would automatically be using Internet Explorer, too. Companies such as Netscape had no way to compete. According to the lawsuit, that wasn't fair. The trial was a terrible blow to Bill, but many people had no sympathy for him or his company. During the rise of his computer empire, Bill had made many enemies. His critics said Bill wanted to win at all costs. In the business world, he was seen as a big bully. Many people thought Bill was arrogant. Even at the trial, he seemed defiant. Bill said that being sued by his government was the worst thing that had ever happened to him. To Bill, the legal charges against his company made no sense. He pointed out that Microsoft spent billions each year to research and develop new products. Punishing a company for success would be a threat to innovation, Bill claimed. The court did not agree with Bill. In 2000, a judge ordered Microsoft to be split into one company for operating systems and a second for software development. Later, the ruling was overturned. Finally, in 2002, the case was settled in Microsoft's favor. Although Microsoft had to change some of the ways it did business, the giant company could stay in one piece. The trial lasted four years, but through it all, Bill kept showing up to work each day with his usual energy. Why did he even bother to work when he had so much money? Someone asked that very question and sent it in to a newspaper column that Bill wrote. The column was called Ask Bill. Bill wrote back, the answer is simple. I do what I find interesting and challenging, and I think I have the best job in the world. Nonetheless, Bill was no longer thinking about Microsoft morning, noon, and night. Serious world problems had caught his attention. Bill had begun to think he should use his mind, power, and money to help solve those problems. Chapter 10. Sharing the Wealth The English language has a special word for a person who donates a lot of money to the common good. Philanthropist. After years of making enormous amounts of money, Bill began giving enormous amounts away. Important people in Bill's life inspired him to be generous. His mother, Mary Gates, had been active in charity work before she died in 1994. Bill's friend, Warren Buffett, also urged him to donate his fortune to good causes. But probably the biggest influence on Bill was his wife, Melinda. She was a down-to-earth woman who believed in helping others. Bill and Melinda talked about what to do with their large fortune. They decided to give 95% of it away. Bill said, I believe with great wealth comes great responsibility. 
a responsibility to give back to society. In 2000, the couple created the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. A foundation is like a business that is set up to give away money. Bill and Melinda donated billions of dollars from their personal fortune to their foundation. Now they ask themselves this question, how can we do the most good for the greatest number with the resources we have? Bill had read a report that said millions of children in poor countries were dying from diseases that no longer existed in richer countries. There were diseases such as polio, malaria, and yellow fever. So many of these children could be saved by getting a vaccine that cost just a few cents. Bill showed the information to Melinda. We were shocked, Bill told the TV interviewer. If you believe that every life has equal value, it's revolting to learn that some lives are seen as worth saving and others are not. We said to ourselves, this can't be true. But if it is true, it deserves to be the priority of our giving. Bill stepped down as CEO of Microsoft in 2000. He handed over the job to his college friend, Steve Ballmer, who had been with Microsoft since 1980. Then in 2006, he announced that he was getting ready to retire from Microsoft to work full-time at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Polio. In the first half of the 20th century, polio was one of the most dreaded diseases of childhood. Although some who came down with polio suffered no lasting effects, it often left children paralyzed or crippled. Adults could catch polio too. Perhaps the most famous victim of polio was U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt. After catching the disease as an adult, he was confined to a wheelchair and could only walk a few steps with the aid of heavy leg braces. 60 years ago, polio was at its peak, afflicting almost 60,000 people in the United States in the year 1952 alone. Then vaccines were discovered that prevented polio. When someone caught the disease, there was no cure. One vaccine was called the Salk vaccine after Dr. Jonas Salk. It was injected into a patient with a needle. Another vaccine was the Sabin vaccine named after Dr. Albert Sabin. It came in liquid form. Patients only had to drink a small amount. The vaccines were truly wonder drugs. Very quickly, they wiped out polio in the Western hemisphere. However, it still rampaged in poor countries where people could not get or afford the vaccine. In 1988, more than 350,000 children worldwide suffered from the disease. That year, the global community took on the goal of ending polio altogether. Bill and Melinda Gates have poured funds into the cause. In his 2011 annual foundation letter, Bill Gates reported that the number of cases had gone down by 99%. But he added, the last 1% remains a true danger. Cases could crop up and spread again. We are so close, but we have to finish the last leg of the journey, Bill urged. We need to bring the cases down to zero. June 27th, 2008 was Bill's last full-time day at Microsoft. He was 52 years old and had headed his company for 33 years. In 1975, the staff of Microsoft had been just as two founders, Paul Allen and Bill Gates. Today, Microsoft employs around 90,000 people. Back then, a typewriter sat on every office desk. Today, in the United States, after the software revolution that Bill led, 
A computer sits atop almost every office desk and is in almost every home. The flying logo of Windows opens on more than 75 million of these computers around the world. Chapter 11, Life Today. In March 2010, Bill was bumped down to the second richest man in the world. Bill said, obviously I don't care. It had happened because he had given $28 billion to his foundation by then. Today, Bill throws himself into work, just as always. With his usual intensity, he works to lift people out of extreme poverty, cure diseases, and improve U.S. education, especially in inner cities. As before, Bill loves his job. The day-to-day -day part of it is fun, he said. He and Melinda travel to faraway spots in the world to get a first-hand view of problems. One day recently, he found himself in a tent with a tribal leader in a remote village where no one had ever heard the name Bill Gates. Other days find Bill talking to scientists about their complex research. The work requires Bill to master all sorts of scientific knowledge in order to decide which ideas should get money. Every day, Bill faces countless hard decisions. He needs to draw on business skills he developed as the CEO of a large company. Sometimes the foundation takes risks that don't work out. Bill realizes that's part of the job. He and Melinda wrote guiding principles for their foundation. One was, we take risks, make big bets, and move with urgency. We're in it for the long haul. Bill also meets with government officials all around the world. In 2011, the global economy was sinking. Many countries were cutting back on their aid programs. Bill fought against these cutbacks. The world's poorest will not be visiting government leaders to make their case. He pointed out. So I want to help make their case. Leaders tend to listen to Bill. Bill gives them sensible reasons for continuing aid programs, the kind of reasons he would have listened to earlier in his career. He said, I understand the need for belt tightening in downturns. But he pointed out that in many countries, Aid is only about 1% of public spending. That amount of money isn't causing the world's fiscal problems, Bill said. He added that there was a huge payback for giving. It made countries more stable and less violent. Bill and Melinda have seen firsthand some of the terrible problems in the world. Yet Bill often says, Melinda and I are optimists. That means they have great hope for the future. Bill believes that new advances in high-tech world can give us a chance we've never had before to end extreme poverty and end death from preventable disease. In his free time, Bill still enjoys reading. Recently, he read a 400-page book about vaccines and enjoyed it. A reporter asked him if that made him a geek. I pled guilty, said Bill with a smile, gladly. Other pastimes Bill likes are playing tennis and the card game bridge. But as Bill once said in a newspaper interview, he's not a sit on the beach type. To him, that's boring. Fun to Bill is being with Melinda and the kids. No matter how busy he gets, Bill says that the kids are a big part of my schedule. And work itself is fun to Bill. That's one of the reasons he has been able to accomplish so much. It is easy to see why Time Magazine named Bill one of the most influential people of the 20th century. And in 2007, he finally got a degree, an honorary one from Harvard. 
Bill spoke at the Harvard graduation. He joked to his father in the audience, I've been waiting more than 30 years to say this. Dad, I always told you I'd come back and get my degree. How will history judge Bill Gates? Will he be remembered as much for his philanthropy as for his leading role in the computer age? Don't bother asking Bill. He's too busy working. Warren Buffett Warren Buffett is one of the wealthiest men in the world and one of the most generous. Buffett's company is called Berkshire Hathaway. It does not make products the way Microsoft does. Instead, Berkshire Hathaway buys other companies, companies that are run well and whose products Warren Buffett likes, such as Seize Candies, Geico Car Insurance, and Fruit of the Loom Underwear. But Warren Buffett is not only known for his smart business mind, he also is incredibly generous. He has promised to give away 99% of his wealth. In 2006, Warren Buffett pledged a gift of stock worth roughly $30 billion to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to be given over 20 years. With Bill Gates, he also created the Giving Pledge through which almost 70 other billionaires have promised to give at least half of their money to charity. Timeline of Bill Gates' life. 1955, born on October 28th in Seattle, Washington. 1962, reads the entire World Book Encyclopedia. 1968, encounters his first computer a teletype machine. 1973, graduates from Lakeside School. 1974, begins college at Harvard University. 1975, writes the software for the Altair 8800 with Paul Allen, leaves school to start Microsoft with Paul. 1980, Microsoft signs major deal with IBM. 1983, Paul leaves Microsoft. 1987, becomes a billionaire. 1994, marries Melinda French on the island of Lanai in Hawaii. Mother, Mary dies. 1996, daughter Jennifer Catherine is born. 1999, son Rory Jean is born. 2000, creates Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to fight poverty and polio, steps down as CEO of Microsoft. 2002, daughter Phoebe Adele is born. 2007, receives an honorary degree from Harvard University. Timeline of the World 1954, Dr. Jonas Salk begins vaccinating children against polio. 1957, Sputnik is sent into orbit by Soviet Union. 1962, the Space Needle in Seattle is displayed at the city's World Fair. 1969, Neil Armstrong is the first person to walk on the moon. The Woodstock Rock Music Festival goes on for three days in August. 1975, Popular Electronics announces the world's first mini computer kit. 1979, Pac-Man video game is released in Japan. 1982, E.T., the extraterrestrial comes out in movie theaters. 1985, Wreck of Titanic is discovered. 1991, the World Wide Web is created. 1992, the first photograph is uploaded to the internet. 1997, 
Tiger Woods wins his first Masters tournament. 2001. Terrorists attack the Twin Towers in New York City and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. 2004. Facebook is first launched. 2008. Barack Obama is elected President of the United States.